Hi, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Hey, no worries. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. And yourself? I'm good. Thank you. Okay, good. Just Where making sure that you? was working. Um, I'm in New York. This is my like library home office. Wow. Is yeah. this in your apartment? It's in my apartment. Yes. I love it. I love all the books. I have I have books behind me too. I see that. Yours look awesome. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I like how you have the little cages in case you know what, they're gonna run away and escape. Yeah, so all the books that you see here are actually my books, but they're just my books in all sorts of different languages. And of course, I have, I don't know how many, 20 plus or whatever, and they've all been translated a lot of times. So every book you see is actually mine. Not that I can read them because they're in foreign languages. <laughs> That's so cool. I love that. Wow. Um, how neat to have a library, all of your own writing. I mean, right. Very inspiring. Um, well, thanks for uh, coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This is such an honor to talk to you. I've read so many of your books. The Return is so great. Um, I've been reading it you know, every night as my kids are going to bed, and um, it's fantastic. So thank you um, <laughs> for all the content you put out into the world. You're welcome. Um, can, you, um, can you tell listeners who aren't familiar yet with The Return what inspired you to write this book and what was really the main premise of it for you? Well, I think the, the initial thought uh, for, the, for the novel, and you have to have an initial thought, uh, was I wanted to do a story with the theme of love and mystery. And I hadn't done that for a long time. The last time I did that, I think, was in a novel called Abend in the Road. Um, and I've written other themes since then. I've done epic love, like The Longest Ride, or Love and Danger, like uh, The Guardian and, and Safe Haven. Um, I've done Everlasting Love, you know, in every breath. But this time I wanted to go back to love and mystery. And of course, I wanted to make it as different as I could than my previous attempt. And so once you start with that, your, your next question is, okay, what's the mystery? And uh, I realized, uh, what if there was a guy and his grandfather died and his grandfather said some things that just didn't make sense? And that of course leads to, well, who is this, who is this person? And so uh, once, it, once you have that, uh, I think the, the, the primary element I wanted to explore was uh, the concept of the aftermath of trauma and how people react when something terrible happens in their own life. And so the characters in this novel, without giving, up, giving things away, have all experienced a trauma and they all react in different ways while trying to do the best they can. And, and I wanted to explore that perhaps because like everyone, you know, I've had trauma in my own life. I think it's, it's part of the universal human experience. And, it's, and, so, and so that makes it something that everyone can relate to. And uh, as always, uh, I, I did my best to create characters who, even if they weren't necessarily doing what you would have done, you understand why they're doing what they're doing. And all of the, those two themes, you know, the aftermath of trauma and uh, a little mystery came together and little by little, the story came, to, came into place. Wow. Um, I feel like your main character here though has had more trauma than most. I mean, first of all, um, everything with his experience um, being a surgeon in the medical hospital and um, the PTSD that you talk, you write so well about in this story, but also his family history. I mean, it's like one thing after another. I mean, the poor guy, it's amazing. He can even like get out of bed in the morning. But anyway, um, it's great to then explore because you do have to get out of bed, no matter how much baggage you have, like the days I, always keep coming. I mean, if you're lucky. So how do you deal with that? And like, what do you, you know, how do you get one, put one foot in front of the other when, you know, you've lost your ear and your, you know, just all this stuff. Um, anyway. It's, sure. Well, and he, he, of course, 
didn't hop up the next day. That's right. part of his journey. You know, first, he got really good at Grand Theft Auto. On the, right. Yes, on the I computer. liked that. Um, I was actually, uh, he got really good at Grand Theft Auto and drank too much until his yes. girlfriend left him. And then he said, hmm, maybe I better start changing things, right? Yes. I was and like, I think should, that, should I tell my son, who's like obsessed with GTA, that it's actually in the book that I'm reading? I don't know. Of course, <laughs> of course. And he'll say, see, mom, it's helpful. Yeah. It's therapeutic. Exactly, exactly. Well, I can't give him any more excuses to play video games. So I don't think I'm going to bring it up. <laughs> um, gotcha. But actually, one thing that I found so interesting in your book that I feel like doesn't come up as often, I was trying to rack my brain for other examples, is um, really exploring that relationship between a man and his own therapy. I feel like it happens a lot with women, right? You hear women and their therapists, but it's just not as common. And the relationship between Bowen and Trevor, it really coursed throughout the book and, and deepened your understanding of, of Trevor and where he was coming from and even gave the reader some good, helpful therapeutic tips for, you know, getting on your own life. So tell me about uh, developing that relationship in the story. Yeah, I think it's, uh, of course, there still is a stigma with mental health. And there are those who uh, have an automatic negative view toward therapy. And, you know, I, 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 part of me wants to blow up that kind of, that kind of thinking because um, I, I think that for some people in certain situations, therapy can be very beneficial. And I think that a lot of people who don't uh, believe in the concept of therapy or believe in it as long as it's not them because they're fine, um, don't necessarily understand the the evolution of therapy. So really, really long story short, you know, Sigmund Freud started psychoanalysis. And this is what most people think that a lot of therapy is. It's someone laying on the couch and talking about their dreams and this and that. And that was very prominent for a long time. And that's what therapy was. But eventually, uh, therapists and patients learned that knowing the root cause of something doesn't necessarily help you change it. It's like, I know the root cause of why I eat too much ice cream. <laughs> it's because it's, and that's why I, you know, I gain weight. Here's why it tastes good, right? So knowing the reason why won't necessarily help you. So a lot of therapy has, has changed from uh, trying to understand why to what you do. What can you do in that instant when you have an urge for ice cream? And of course, this is, you, you can substitute any, any issue that someone's having. What, what can I do if I get angry? What can I do if my hands begin to shake, as in the case of Trevor? And there's, there's things you can do, and it's cognitive behavioral therapy and dialectical behavior therapy. And they say, hey, you know, let's, they, they give you a list. Let's do some certain things in those moments and then the rest of your life, let's try to be as healthy as you possibly can. You exercise, you eat right. It's all the advice your mother gave you. Exercise, eat right, sleep right, avoid mood-altering substances to a great extent. And then in these moments, what can you do when you get angry? I can turn and walk away. I can uh, try to reframe the situation. I can, you know, there, there's things you do in that moment. And, and that's really what I wanted to explore is to give a, a, an idea for those who haven't had therapy or who don't know what it is or have a negative view of it, why it can be so beneficial. Trevor knows why he's messed up. He needs to know what to do to not be angry at a Home Depot when someone cuts him off in line. He has to know what to do when his hands begin to shake. And that's really the uh, the... The, the, the therapy that he's most interested in is because doing the right thing in, in situations that are challenging leads you to becoming a very healthy version of yourself. That's true. I think I need to remember that as I, you know, look in the freezer at night and, <laughs> <laughs> and look for the ice cream. Look for the ice cream. Knowing, why, knowing why you want it, that's not going to help. Yeah. But, it doesn't but perhaps, help at all. Yeah. I want it because I, I just want it and now I'm going to have it. <laughs> Or because I'm angry, you know, when you were listing the the, the behaviors you should that it should anger should elicit, I guess 
eating is not really the best uh, coping mechanism, but you know, we'll leave sure. that for somebody else's therapy. It's so funny you say this too, because I know it's um, so dependent on kind of where in the country you live or who you're surrounded by, how people feel about therapy and all the different views. I was a psychology major and I'm from New York City and like therapy here is just like what you do. I mean, it's like so common, but I know there are so many other places and even different religions or different cultures where it's just not as accepted. So it's great to have a book like this which so normalizes it and explains it clearly and um, carefully and calmly and, and outlines um, all the benefits. So that's awesome. Thank you. Sure. Um, I read about how your mother is really responsible for all of your success by getting you to start writing at a very early age and you were dabbling in all sorts of other professions at that time or you were so young, but um, didn't, didn't, really see this coming necessarily for yourself. Can you tell me a little more about getting your start and how you started in pharmaceutical sales and, um, sure. you know, selling dental devices or whatever you're doing and ended up being you? Right. Um, so my mom originally got me into writing. I was 19. At that time, I was very into track and field. I was very competitive. I was on scholarship at, and uh, it was my world. I had dreams of being an Olympic gold medalist and and that's all I wanted. Uh, I get injured uh, after my, during my freshman year. Over the summer, I was just miserable. I couldn't train. I had all this excess energy. I was imagining all my competitors getting better. I was falling behind. It was emotionally traumatic, mentally, physically. I was just not in my right head. And my mom knew it. And she said, well, look, don't just pout. Do something. And I said, what? She said, I don't know. Go write a book. And so I did, right? And so I wrote a novel and I was 19 and it took me about six weeks and uh, it was terrible. But, uh, and I'm not being false modesty there. It was like a 19 year old writing his very first novel and do, taking six weeks to do it. Um, but I learned that I liked stories and I, 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 of course, never thought I could make a living at it. So finish up college, get my degree, don't get a job right away. So I write a second novel uh, that never gets published. I say, what am I going to do? Uh, I kind of experiment with some different jobs for a while, find out what's calling me, what's speaking to me. And then when I was 28, I kind of had an early midlife crisis and said, well, what can I do in the evening while keeping my job? Because I had bills and things. And I sat down and write the note, wrote the notebook. So it's kind of like a start and a stop, and then a start and then a stop, and then a start and here I am. Wow. And I heard that, or I shouldn't say I heard, I read that um, an agent just found it in their slush pile and, and brought it to the top. And that's how you got discovered. Yeah, pretty much. Right. Wow. I sent letters uh, out to a bunch of agencies and uh, someone pulled it out of the non-solicited, you know, query pile and said, Hey, take a look at this. And that agent uh, read the letter, asked for my book, read it in a couple of days and her, her name is Teresa Park and she's still my agent to this day. Wow. I love that. And that's so encouraging too, for all the people who submit blindly that it can happen and it can Absolutely. be a smash hit and all the rest. Um, you mentioned earlier that your own trauma sort of informs your writing. And um, I read that your little sister had died of a brain tumor. And I'm so sorry to have heard that. Is that one of the things that motivates your writing? Um, and if so, I was hoping maybe you could speak to that if you feel comfortable. Yeah, there was a, there was a period there about seven years where there was one loss after another. My mother died in a horseback riding accident oh. and my father died in a car accident. Oh. I mean, uh, my sister's having this brain tumor and then she eventually passes away. And this was all, in, in a very brief period I'm so sorry. and certainly um, when you get hit with, with these traumas um, there's, you know, you, you go through it as, as best you can. I had children, I, I had bills, I, I still had responsibilities and, uh, and, and it was, and it was challenging. And I found that I reacted differently to each of these traumas. Uh, because of my age, because of where I was, because of the addition of additional responsibilities. Um, but they certainly inform my writing, particularly when I write about grief or loss or trauma. 
such as in the rescue. And that was one of the big things, as I mentioned earlier, that, that I really wanted to explore is you've got three characters that have trauma and they all react in different ways. And just as I reacted in three different ways after each of my own traumas. And in each of those cases, even, even though I, I reacted differently, I was just trying to do my best at that time to negotiate the cavalcade of emotion that I was feeling while putting one step in front of the other. So it certainly informs uh, my writing. It's led to direct inspiration. Message in a Bottle was directly inspired by my father after the death of my mother. A Walk to Remember was inspired by my sister. So, um, you know, certainly it's informed or inspired specific stories. But uh, at the same time, that there's elements there that have woven their way into each and every one of my novels as well. Well, I'm so sorry about all that you've been through. How, as a dad, do you talk about loss and grief to your own kids? Like, how do you help them make sense of the things that have happened in your family? Well, it's a, it's a difficult question to answer. And even though my kids, they range in age from 28 to 18, you know, they, they've suffered loss too, not necessarily their parents or their siblings like me, but, you know, 28 years, we've lost pets, right? We've lost, you know, that we've had, they've had friends who've passed away unexpectedly. And in the end, I think the most important thing you can do is to, is to validate their feelings. And so you, you, you listen to them and, and you're empathetic to them and you're with them in that moment. And then you don't necessarily try to help. You, you validate. You say, someone says, I feel so sad. I can't stop crying. You don't say, well, death is a part of life. You know, it's not going to help them. What you do is say, I know you do. You know, I have no doubt that it feels absolutely awful. And part of you might even wonder if you'll ever stop crying. Now, anyone will respond to that. And then, yeah, that's how I feel. And what that does is it, it opens up the ability to uh, communicate on a, on a deeper level. But the most important thing is to, is to validate. Um, and you say, look, you know, I get it. You know, I've been through it and it's the hardest thing ever. But that's whether it's children or whether it's friends or whether it's siblings or, or whether it's anyone. It is to when someone is hurting, uh, empathy, active listening, and then really responding to what specifically they're saying and not trying to fix it. Just letting them know you fully understand what they're going through. I mean, you should have been a therapist. <laughs> <laughs> well, perhaps, right? I've, got, I've had a lot of children. I mean, you've done fine for yourself. Not to say this was not the right career for you. you it's fine. But, you know, I'm just saying, you obviously have a gift in, in this area as well. So it's a fallback, you know, fallback career. <laughs> fallback, right. Right. Well, and of course, maybe that, uh, you know, I'm hopeful some of that went through the, the, the return. Absolutely. Um, when you write, what is your writing process like? How long does each book usually take you? Where do you like to write? Is it somewhere else in that room with the beautiful books? Or yeah, I write here. I write here. I write in the kitchen. I write in uh, another room near the kitchen. And then I have a second office off the gym, much more informal. And I sometimes write there, but I, I can write anywhere. I can write on airplanes and hotel rooms. And I have, uh, but just generally, uh, I, I write at home because I'm at home a lot. And I, and I pick a spot based on my mood, essentially. Uh, novels take about six months to write and then probably another 10 weeks to edit. But much of that 10 weeks is not hovering over the keyboard. It's you send it up to them and then they take two and a half, three weeks, and then they send back suggested changes. So you work really hard for a week and then you send it up again and you wait another three weeks and then you make those changes. So it follows that. Uh, and then after that, uh, you know, you're a good chunk into the year. The rest of the time is spent on tour and then conceiving the next novel. And then you start all over again. And how has uh, the pandemic been your first sort of tour 
throughout this new yeah. world well, that we're in. It will, it will certainly be a different tour than I've, I've done in the past. Uh, of course, we're very concerned about safety and uh, I, I certainly don't want to do uh, things that would make people feel exposed or, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of feelings and some people, um, nobody, you know, very few people who want to get this thing. So what can we do? So we've, even though I will be going out and I think it's important to support local bookstores and things like that, you know, it, it's all designed with, uh, with safety in mind. And so uh, we'll see how it goes. I think I'm going to six or seven different uh, bookstores. I, and, uh, we're limiting the lines, not that we're limiting people who can get signed books, but you know, there's ticketed and only some people come then and it's spread throughout the day. And I sign the books in advance. And if we take a picture, there's plexiglass between us, everything oh you have to gosh. do so that people will feel safe, you know, and, and that's the most important thing on this tour is to do it in the safest way possible. And how about the last six months? Well, the pandemic has been sort of raging. Have you been working on new books during this time? Yeah, I finished another novel and uh, it's now uh, in the editing process. So I've done that. I've started another novel and uh, just about done with that one as well. So it's been, a, I guess a, a work-wise, it's been fairly productive. But uh, like everyone, um, you know, COVID has, has hit home. You know, my daughter had it and, uh, you know, she went, went through that, that whole experience. And so it's of course affected um, it, me as much as it's affected anyone, right? Uh, very limited. I've been largely sheltering at home and, uh, uh, and that's why it's on the, on the plus side, if there is one, you know, uh, I've worked from home for years and it was my normal thing. So I was now, so that part has not changed. Wow. So how do you keep, I mean, you've written dozens of books. How do you keep coming up with new characters, new plot lines? Do they all like, you're like, Oh, I just wrote another novel and I'm on it. I mean, it's just like, it sounds so casual for you. Whereas some people, it takes them their whole lives to come up with one novel. How does it work for you? Is it just like the engine. And once you keep going, once you go, the creativity keeps going or how, how does it work for you? Yeah, it was interesting when I started, uh, when I first started in 1996, that's what you were supposed to do, right? The notebook was published in 1996. And at that time, authors wrote a book a year. So if you wanted to be a successful author, you had to figure it out. You know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit different now. Authors, you know, whether you're Dan Brown or you're Gillian Flynn or Den Dennis Lehane, for instance, all excellent, excellent writers. And I love their work. You know, they might put out, they, they don't necessarily put out a, a novel a year. But back when I was starting, that's what you had to do. And so I figured, well, that's the only way to do it. And you get in the habit of doing that. And so I've done that. So uh, once you reach this stage, uh, my goal is always the same as it has been since the very beginning, which is to write the best book possible, one that feels original to the reader, one that you know, strikes them as something entirely new that they haven't read before, even while knowing it'll be set in North Carolina, even while knowing there's romantic elements. So how on earth do you make it different? So I think about what haven't I done? What haven't I done recently? You know, we talked about the theme of mystery, hadn't done that in a long time. So that was one of the original thoughts in this book. Let me have a mystery that leads to all sorts of questions. What is the mystery? And then I say, what, what, what really haven't I explored? Uh, three different reactions to trauma. Brand new idea, nothing I've ever written about before. I've done it with individual characters, but not every character in that novel. And I say, oh, okay, so these something I haven't done in a long time, something I have never done before. This is all new. This is all original. And then from there, you just keep asking yourself, what if questions regarding, you know, what if the character's 50? What if the character's 40? What if the character's 30? Um, you know, then what happens to the story? And you kind of, you know, what is the mystery? Well, what if this? What if that? What if this? So then you just kind of keep walking all the way through until the story forms in your mind and you're beginning to, uh, you're ready to begin writing. 
Wow. I actually, I found myself getting a bit impatient, like really wanting to know what the backstory was for Natalie and why she was looking sad all the time. And I was like, what is going on with her? When are we finding, what are we finding out? I can't wait to know anymore. So um, anyway, uh, all of them actually, I mean, um, but yes, hers in particular. So what types of books do you like to read in your spare time? Uh, I, 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 Oh, no, you froze. You have your traditional bestsellers. You have your classics. You have uh, foreign literature. You have award-winning literature. Um, different styles, something, uh, poetry. So I'll read, you know, I read that. And that's probably about 60% of what I read. The other 40% is nonfiction. And I find that my own interests are drawn toward histories and just kind of obscure histories. Um, generally, um, yeah, I don't want big sweeping things. I do read those, but you know, I might read a book like Salt, and it's the history of salt, or Fermat's Enigma, and it's uh, basically the story of math or something like that. Um, I am also drawn toward biographies of people long since dead and hardly ever polit- political figures. Um, so that's so history, biographies, a lot of sociology. A lot of sociology, uh, books by John Krakauer, things like that, whether it's uh, Missoula, which, which you know, discussed, uh, let's say, uh, date rape on college campuses and the reality, uh, and it was set in Missoula, Montana, things like that. So modern sociology as well. I'm, I'm very interested in that. And how has your, I know so many of your books have been made into movies. How are you feeling about the movie aspect of your work? Like, do you see it all kind of cinematically as you're writing it? Or do you really enjoy the adaptations of all the stories? Like what's your general takeaway from that element? Oh, of your writing? Yeah, I, I, I generally write all my, no- I'm all, I always try to conceive a novel with the idea that it will be both a novel and a film. And then when I write, I only think about the novel. And then after the novel is written, I only think about the film. And it's important to understand that the nature of Hollywood has been changing over the last 10 years. Uh, International markets are much larger than they used to be for the box office. Um, Streaming has become much more evident. Novels are now being adapted into limited series or extended series. So there's a lot of changes. And then of course, in comes COVID-19 and people don't, aren't sure when and where they can start filming and, and there's challenges associated with that. So for, for right now, it's a little tricky to navigate and uh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. Do you have any advice for aspiring authors? Last question. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, the, the, the best advice is to read a lot. And uh, one of the, the standard jokes that I ever say and when I speak in front of a crowd and get asked this question is, uh, you know, they say, well, what advice do you have for aspiring writers? And I say, well, I'll tell you what ha- helped me. When I was a kid, I watched a lot of TV. And, and I mean that, you know, uh, because there's things you can learn from television or there's things you can learn from film and there's things you can learn from, from novels. I certainly was a very avid reader. But if you watch television, you'll note that practically every show you watch, I'm talking about more about network television, but even on streaming, it's just kind of slightly different. Um, They're really good at ending before the commercial or at the end of the show with a bit of a cliffhanger that makes you want to go and see what happens next. And of course, anyone familiar with my writing is I try to make it almost impossible to stop reading at the end of a chapter because you have to know what happens next. And where do you learn that? You learn that more in television and film than you would, for instance, in let's say a classic novel by Flaubert um, or, or someone like that or, or Proust. Um, so sure, read, you know, understand story. Uh, and, and that's, and stories can be understood. And then um, I think the best thing is to, uh, figure out what you really want to write. Um, uh, Because there's a difference. Do I want to write something that may or may not get published? Well, that's a different standard than I want to write something that will 100% be published, which is a different standard than I want something that's going to be a bestseller, which is a different standard than I want to be 
wonderfully critically reviewed in the New York Times and on NPR or, or things like that. They're all different. So to be clear on, uh, on what you intend to write. And then finally, if you're a young writer, whatever you do, don't write about a young character. Because everyone says, write what you know. But uh, the, thing, the thing that happens when you're young is that you think all of your thoughts are original. And really, everyone's had them before. <laughs> so for my first novel, right? Uh, my first novel, The Notebook, my main character was 80 years old. Wow. Well, this has been a particularly great episode for my son, because now, in addition to GTA and playing video games, you have said that watching TV is really good for you. <laughs> so <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess I'm going to have to play it for him. But, <laughs> uh, but thank you so much for your time. Thanks for sharing um, your personal history and um, for the return, which was so great. So thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Have a great day. You Bye-bye. too. Bye. Bye.